an honor to be here, always an honor to be here uh, at the 700 Club and Regents. It's, uh, uh, it seems like the Lord releases the books. Uh, there's always, I'm always here when it happens. And um, uh, I want to say first, uh, just to encourage you, um, I said this at a, once a, a smaller meeting, but I was asked to go to Cuba. Fidel Castro opened the island for a one month for the gospel to go in the island to show the world that he had religious freedom. Well, I was asked to, to open it up, and when I was in Cuba, a lot of amazing things happened, but I met a, a little special boy named Fidelito, or Fidel, and he was a very, very special uh, boy and who loved the Lord, but I never knew what happened to him because I was never able to go back. And then I found out when I came here, it's 15 years later, that he's now working here with you. He's on staff. <laughs> Are you here? Why don't you stand up, Fidelito? Dios te bendiga, mi hermano. Cuba para Cristo. <laughs> Amen. And before I begin, let me tell you uh, one other uh, story. I know uh, uh, that your work, you, you don't see, you will never see all the fruits of your work, but there was a Jewish young man uh, who was watching the 700 Club, and, uh, uh, and it was during the seven days of blaze uh, in watching that that he gave his life to the Lord. And that was me. So thank God for your ministry. Now it's the seven days of blaze here. Let's pray. Father, we just ask your blessing now. Have your way. Lord, I ask in my weakness, be strong in your power and touch your people. And touch those who watch. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Well, because it's the beginning and launching this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little taste of what is the revelation of the paradigm, a taste of it, and then it's gonna to lead to, to a message for you and for this time. Imagine if there was a discovery that there was a master blueprint from ancient times that reveals everything that's happening right now. And a blueprint that goes back over two and a half thousand years ago, but that reveals the events of our times. And not only what is to happen, but when the events are to happen, pinpoints events down to the year, in some cases to the month, even to the exact dates. Imagine if it revealed the people of our times, leaders of our times, their actions, their personalities, in some cases the parameters of their names. Imagine if it gave the exact times when they were allowed to be on the national stage, what, it, what the years would be. What if it revealed that, that each leader in our times is following an ancient leader, the prototype of an ancient leader, what if the Bible, from the Bible, could actually reveal the outcome of American elections? And what if we're replaying this mystery? The, we're in this big thing. And what if we could open it up? Well, the blueprint is the paradigm. And if it's possible, if we could have known it, if, first of all, is, could there be a warning in there? Could there also be the keys of, of prevailing at such a time as this? If we could have known this, I didn't know it before, this just came to me, if we could have known it beforehand, you could have actually marked your calendars to put down when colossal events of our time would happen to the exact days. The paradigm concerns a prophetic revelation. It's very much like The Harbinger. I didn't plan on writing it, I was gonna write a different book, but like The Harbinger just came to me out of the blue and it happened in January. And rapidly, I had 60 days to write it then for this to get out today. In fact, it intersects with the revelation of the harbinger. The harbinger reveals the prophetic signs of judgment, warnings from ancient times that are reappearing now in America. But the paradigm reveals that everything is part of this mystery. As if everything happening around us is part of a harbinger, of a civilization that has been heading away from God to judgment. It's the most explosive thing I've ever written. So explosive I hesitated to put it down on paper. I prayed, but I knew I had to, and I gave this warning. If you get, you get this, just don't put it next to anything flammable. You don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> but though it will mention people, the point is not people. They are signs. We must oppose all evil, but we must love and pray for those who commit evil. To set the stage, the paradigm reveals a nation that wants to do God, which was Israel, but a nation that turned away from God, drove God out of its public squares, called what was evil good, called what was good evil, promoted sexual immorality. American civilization was also founded on the word of God. 
But we've un been undergoing the same metamorphosis. We have likewise driven God out of the public square. We've embraced other gods. We won't call them gods. We've embraced idols. We too call what is evil good and what is good evil. We promoted immorality. And as Israel did on the altars of Baal, we have also sacrificed children on modern altars, not thousands, but tens of millions. But in the fall of ancient Israel, there came a period where the apostasy, the fall, accelerated, where pagan morality became the ruling morality, when it was endorsed from the palace, when the nation experienced a culture war. In America, we've also witnessed an acceleration in the last quarter century, really beginning in the 90s with what was called a culture war, where an anti-biblical morality replaced the ruling morality, and it's happened to this day. In the paradigm is this culture war with the rise of a king. The king is called Ahav, or Ahab. He's a divided man, he knows about God, but he's compromised. He knows of it, but he wars against the ways of God. He becomes the first king in Israel's history to champion the worship of Baal, to join the state to Baal. In other words, Baal worship meant child sacrifice, so he is now endorsing child sacrifice from the throne and overturning biblical absolutes and traditional values, so too. In America, when you have this culture war, at the same time you have the rise of a man, Bill Clinton will follow the paradigm of Ahab. He will be a man divided. He will know of God from a, from a Bible Belt culture, yet now warring against his ways, divided, compromised. He will be the first president in American history to ally the state with a championing of the offering of children in abortion as Ahab did with Baal. But Ahab was not alone, and neither was Bill Clinton. In the chapter of the paradigm called The Queen, a new figure enters the stage. Her name in Hebrew is Isabel. We know her as Jezebel. Again, this is not about the people. They don't know what they're doing. It's about signs. She grows up in a cosmopolitan culture, liberal values. She's the daughter of the priest of the goddess Astarte. She worships female power. She will marry Ahab, move to his land, but she will never adopt the values or the traditional values. She'll see traditional values as something to war against. And so she will war against it with her husband. Hillary Clinton will follow the paradigm of Isabel or Jezebel. According to that, she'll grow up in a cosmopolitan culture. She'll venerate female power. She'll marry Bill Clinton, move to the Bible Belt, but never adopt the values there. She'll see traditional values as an obstacle. She will see biblical faith as something to war against. She'll make a famous statement, deep-seated religious beliefs have to be changed so that abortion can expand. She will war that way, and as Ahab and Jezebel formed a co-regency, both ruling, so for the first time in American history, there was a co-presidency with Bill and Hillary Clinton. Jezebel became the chief advocate of Baal worship, that's child sacrifice. Hillary Clinton has become the chief advocate of abortion. It's written that Ahab built a temple of Baal in the capital city. Well, when Clinton came to the White House, now Washington, D.C. became the center of advocating for abortion. So when he assumed the presidency, he became the first president to do many things that we are still living with now. Now, there's a chapter called The Days of the King. The question is asked, how long was Bill Clinton on the national stage? When did his rise to power begin? It began on the, on the year 1979 when he was elected for the first time as governor of Arkansas. What happens if you, when was the entire reign? So it was 1979 and he ended in the year 2001, January. That's a period that comes out to 22 years, 22 years of Bill Clinton. In 1 Kings it is written, Ahab the son of Omri, Omri reigned in Samaria for a period of 22 years. The years of Bill Clinton are determined following the paradigm of King Ahab. In the days of the king and queen, there were not only scandal, or actually apostasy, there was also scandal, known as the scandal of the vineyard of Naboth. And so the paradigm would say the Clinton years will not only be defined by a going away from traditional values, but by personal scandal. Well, we know a scandal breaks forth, is exposed, that will mark the presidency and lead to the impeachment of the president, a scandal of coveting taking possession, the Lewinsky scandal. The fall of Ahab was linked to the tribe of Levi. I won't go into why it's in the book. It's linked to the tribe of Levi. His reign would end in the city, killed in the city of the Levites. Could a modern presidential scandal actually be linked to the tribe of Levi? 
From the name Levi comes the name Levin. From Levin comes Lewin. From Lewin comes Lewinsky. The Lewinsky scandal actually bears the name of the tribe of Levi. It's actually named after it. And it wasn't just the name. Monica Lewinsky was actually a child of the tribe of Levi as it was linked to the fall of Ahab. When does the biblical paradigm say the king's sin will be exposed? It happened in the 19th year of the king, King Ahab. What happens if we take the beginning of Clinton's time on the national stage, add 19 years, it comes to 1998. 1998 is the year that the scandal is exposed in Washington. And actually, he was sworn in in January, so you take to January 1998, that become, that's the exact month that the scandal was exposed. But it's going to get even more mind-boggling because the paradigm reveals something else. In the midst of the scandal, when Elijah the prophet is waiting for Ahab in the vineyard and says, this, is, this will bring judgment, Ahab repents. And God says, because he repented, the calamity won't come now. But what happens is this. If you look in the Bible, there's a period of three years from the time the king repents to the time a calamity will come on the nation. Well, did Bill Clinton ever repent of the scandal? The answer is he did. It took place in the East Room of the White House during a gathering of ministers. He said, this is my repentance, I've sinned. He did. The paradigm says there'll be three years from the king's repentance to a time of calamity. What happens if you take the date that this happened, Bill Clinton, the date of this repentance and add the three years of the paradigm, where does it take you? It lands on a particular day. It arrives, brings you to September 11, 2001. That is the day of the calamity. And the day when the repentance took place, it was in the morning. So it's three years later to the morning. It happens 9-11 in the morning. The White House event began at 8.30 in the morning. Three years later, 8.30 will pinpoint the beginning, the, the hour of the beginning of 9-11. And then the, the event ended at 10.30. At 10.30, could that contain the, the calamity? The last event of 9-11 was the fall of the North Tower happened at 10.29. This is a blueprint that is so specific. What happens next? I'm just giving you a nutshell overview, quick things. In the paradigm, the king's reign, Ahab, comes to an end. People think that Ahab and Jezebel, their reign ended together. It didn't. His reign comes to an end, but what happens to the queen? The queen goes on on the political stage. According to the paradigm, Bill Clinton's reign would end, but Hillary Clinton would go on on the political stage. And so as did her ancient prototype, she would dwell in the capital city as did the queen, she would walk the halls of power as did the queen, not now the, that she's the former queen, doesn't have the same power, but she's influencing government. 2008, Hillary Clinton would run for president, but in the paradigm, the throne goes to another, a younger man. He enters the paradigm, he's called the heir. Barack Obama will follow in the paradigm of the, next, of the king, Joram, who was an heir to Ahab. Joram would continue in the policies of Ahab and Jezebel. Obama would follow in the agenda of the Clintons. The reign of Joram would be known for hostility to God and to his ways and to his people. The rule of Barack Obama would be known also for policies that would be hostile to God and biblical values and to religious conservatives. During the reign of Joram, Jezebel the queen would dwell in the palace with the king as almost a counselor. Well, during the reign of Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton dwelt in the White House with Barack Obama. How long was Barack Obama on the national stage? When did his rise begin? We know it. It's exact. He was unknown until he appeared in the Democratic Convention. He gave a speech that launched his rise to power. Overnight, he was spoken of as a potential president. It took place in the year 2004. That November, he was elected to his first national office as senator, and then he was sworn in in January of 2005 in his first national office. Well, what happens if you take that the, his last year as president was 2016, 2004, 2016. It comes out to there are 12 years to Barack Obama on the national stage. When, when he gave the speech at the convention this last summer to nominate Hillary Clinton, he's, the first words were 12 years ago today. 12 years. Open up the book of 2 Kings. It is written, and Joram, the son of Ahab, reigned in Samaria for a period of 12 years. He will follow the prototype as each of them do. The ancient paradigm reveals another figure, very different in the book he's called the Nemesis. In the days of Ahab, there rises a man 
who becomes an enemy, an arch enemy of the nation. He threatens the nation. He becomes a danger to the nation. And he will issue threats that he will attack the nation and he will attack the nation. He will bring destruction. Thus the paradigm in the days of the king, Clinton years, there will rise a man who will become a growing danger to America. His name will be Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden will issue threats against America, will seek to invade it. And actually, I won't go into it, but the paradigm actually gives the parameters of his name. After 9-11 came the greatest manhunt in world history. But with all the world's resources, Bin Laden eluded capture. The trail went dead. But the paradigm reveals that the nemesis will be assassinated. Osama bin Laden thus would be assassinated. He, how would it take place? In the paradigm, the ancient enemy, the assassination begins when the nemesis or the enemy is lying in his bed. The assassination of Osama bin Laden would begin as he was lying in his bed. And he, the paradigm, he will be assassinated in his bedroom. Bin Laden was assassinated in his bedroom. The paradigm gets more specific. It reveals that the nemesis will be assassinated in the 10th year after he brings calamity to the land. 2001, 9-11. Add 10 years comes 2011. 2011 is the year of the assassination of bin Laden. What then does the paradigm reveal about America and where we are now? In ancient Israel, the nation came to a crossroads here. If the house of Ahab continued to rule, it would have sealed the apostasy of the nation, it would have ended religious freedom, would have stamped out the word of God. All religious, well, so with America. We reach a similar crossroads. If the reign of anti-biblical leadership continued, it would have sealed the apostasy, would have, would have encroached religious liberty, we all knew that. It would have sealed the Supreme Court for a generation. But in the ancient paradigm, there comes a surprise. A man who is revealed in the chapter called the warrior. His name is Jehu, and he will be the mystery of Donald Trump. Donald Trump will follow the paradigm of the warrior. Jehu was not a politician. Trump was not a politician. Jehu was a fighter. Trump fights with everybody. <laughs> Jehu was not a gentle man. He was a wild man. And at times he seemed out of control. Do I have to say anything? <laughs> Jehu would come on the national stage. Suddenly he would shake up the, the status quo of the government. So too would Donald Trump. Jehu begins a race to the throne. Trump begins a race to the White House. Jehu mounts up his chariot and heads to the royal city. On the way, a watchman sees the chariot and says, The driving is like that of Jehu, for he driveth furiously. Donald Trump would race, would lead his race furiously. In fact, the word in Hebrew means crazy. If there's anything that described the race of Donald Trump, the word was crazy. The year of the warriors rising in the paradigm is the 12th year of the heir, King Joram. That means in the 12th year of Obama, that pinpoints the year 2016. It is the year of the race and the rising of Donald Trump. In the race, in the rise to the throne, the warrior comes head to head against the former queen, the former first lady, Jezebel. The paradigm would say that Donald Trump will come head to head with Hillary Clinton. If you remember, the polls said that Hillary Clinton was going to trounce, defeat soundly Donald Trump. But the paradigm said something else. The paradigm said when the warrior confronts, meets the former first lady, the former first lady will be defeated and the warrior will be victorious. How long was Hillary Clinton in power on the national stage? 22 years with her husband as first lady of Arkansas, then of America. After that, she was in government 12 years. Then she stepped down out of public life, retired for two years. Then she came back for two more years to run for the presidency. Total of 14 years. So 22 years, 14 years. How long was the ancient Queen Jezebel there on the national stage? 22 years with her husband, and then on her own, 14 years. The Queen's defeat will also come in the 12th year of, the, of Joram. So 2016 would mark the defeat of the former Queen. The warrior, Jehu, will then turn his attention to the capital city where he had to go. And actually, I didn't put this in here. They both went on the day of the defeat, on the day of the victory of the warrior and the defeat of the former queen, both of them are in the northeast, the city's northeast, the nation's chief northeastern city, which in America is New York City. So now 
the warrior, Jehu, turns his attention to the capital city. Donald Trump turns his attention to Washington, D.C. He would head to the capital. Jehu would go to the capital city with an agenda, which was to drain the swamp. <laughs> Donald Trump would head to Washington, D.C. to drain the swamp. On the way to the city, Jehu meets a man called Jehonadab. Who was he? Jehonadab is identified in almost every Bible commentary as a representative of a people, of the people in the land who are called in the commentaries the religious conservatives. Donald Trump, on his way to the White House, would meet with religious conservatives, leaders. In fact, one of those meetings happened here. Jehu would tell the religious conservatives, I'm on your side. And he would ask, join me, come on my side in my race. So Trump would tell religious conservatives, I'm on your side, and ask him, join me. In the paradigm, the religious conservatives, or Jehonadab, says yes, and joins him in the chariot. They go together, the, the warrior and the holy man, go together to the capital. Jehu would war against the worship of Baal and child sacrifices. He would war against witchcraft. In fact, in fact that's the word he uses when he says why he's coming. Those who practice witchcraft would see him as a threat. Not only the, the champions of child sacrifice would have been against Jehu, but they were also against those. The abortion industry was key in warring against Donald Trump. But when he assumed the presidency, something happened that has never happened in American history. Across the nation and across the world, there were gatherings of witches under the moon casting spells against this Jehu. When did all these, things, all these things take place in the paradigm in the 12th year, which is 2016? Now, when Trump got to the White House, actually, when Jehu got to the capital city, got to the throne, what he did was he destroyed the temple of Baal that Ahab had built. Now, this links here in modern terminology, links to the, the, worst, the offering up of children. So what did Trump do? When he came to Washington, he set out to try to dismantle the government's support of child sacrifice, abortion. First act as president was to issue executive orders undoing the orders of Obama to protect now the unborn. But the way it gets in even more uncanny. Because the paradigm says when the warrior rises, the temple of Baal will fall. There actually has been a temple of Baal that has existed from ancient times, still standing for 2,000 years. But it says when the warrior rises, the temple falls. After 2,000 years, the temple of Baal suddenly fell. When? In 2015, just as Trump announced his candidacy. In the summer of 2015, the temple of Baal fell. Now there is much more to be real. I just wanted to give you a taste this morning. But this is to give you an idea of the revelations that are here. And so also, please pray for me, because this is a very explosive book. Please pray. <laughs> the paradigm also gives, speaks of the future. There's a whole section about the future. Gives warning. There's too much to go through now. But it's important to speak about where we are right now. What does the paradigm reveal where we are right now? What do we make of Donald Trump? The point was not Jehu. To this day, the commentaries cannot decide if Jehu knew God or not. But they, just, they are in agreement that he was used by God. Can God use those who have not known God to accomplish his purposes? Yes, absolutely. How was he used? And the point was not, Jehu. how was he used? The nation was on the verge of sealing its apostasy. The house of Ahab would have stamped out the word of God. But God used an unlikely man, a wild man, to stop that, to defeat the house. And to give Israel a reprieve, a window of time, a chance to repent. A window for the righteous, for freedom, to speak the word of God, to have influence in the highest halls of government. A window for revival. And that's exactly where we are now. Jehu wasn't the answer, but he was used to open up a window for the answer, and the answer is revival. There has been a political change, but there has not yet been a cultural change or a moral change or a spiritual one. And if America does not change its course, if America does not see revival, then it will continue its descent to judgment. The mystery of the paradigm actually intersects with the mystery of the harbinger. They actually come together as, the, as it goes on. A nation heading to judgment. The key is what we do now. 
The word is still good that God has given. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, I'll heal their land. The key is my people, and the key is if it is time to pray fervently more than ever for revival. This is a window. Diligently, it is time not only to pray for revival, it's time to start living in revival. Because if we start living in revival, then the revival will start now, here and now. If we turn from our evil ways, that means if there's anything in your life that should not be in the life of one who's so called as you are, now, today, is the time to get it all out once and for all. And what a perfect time as we head to the Feast of Trumpets. This is coming out officially tomorrow, right on the verge of the Feast of Trumpets. The time there's something that's not in your life that God has called for your life for you to become that person of victory, prayer, greater. The time is now, not tomorrow, to rule it into your life before you go to bed. And above all, what the paradigm tells you is that God is real. God is awesome. God is amazing. And he's over all and all, and still he's on the throne, and he has no intention of vacating the throne. And that means he is real in your life, and he's amazing in your life, and he's awesome in your life, and he's over everything in your life. God not only has a paradigm for this age, he has a paradigm for your life. He says, for I know the plans I have, says the Lord. And the word in Hebrew, plan here, mahashabah, here means intricately, literally, this is not just, this is not hype, it's intricately, Hebrew means intricately woven plan for your life. It is written that God has prepared the good works for your life before you even enter them. That is what a paradigm is. He's got a paradigm for your life, a perfect plan. And you can only find it if you fully commit yourself to walking in his will, totally in his will, all out, more than ever, you will find it. Near the end of the book is a chapter called, On This Paradigm, that God has for now, for such a time as this. So the paradigm has the answer of how to live in this time victoriously. It is called the Elijah paradigm. Elijah was not a man of the status quo. He was radical. He was countercultural. He was prophetic. He was revolutionary. That was Elijah. We have moved from the days when the people of God can be of the status quo to the days when they must become radical. From the days when the church appeared as a cultural phenomenon to now we must increasingly stand as a countercultural phenomenon. From a religious phenomenon to a prophetic phenomenon. From a familiar phenomenon to a revolutionary phenomenon. See, if these are the days when evil reigns, then we have to become Elijah's. That we become a revolutionary people. You become a revolutionary person to live revolutionary lives. To shine with a revolutionary witness. We are no longer the candle in the day, Christian culture. We have now become the candle in the night. The candle in the night goes against the night. We may not like the night. We, sometimes we say, I don't, wouldn't want this. You know, but you know what? Keep it in mind. You know, if God didn't want you in the end times, he would have put you in the Middle Ages. <laughs> but he's put you here because he wants you here. He'll anoint you here. But the candle in the night is the candle that lights up the night. Which is more powerful? The candle in the night lights up the world. The one who will hold true to God in such a time will be a hundred times more powerful. It's the same light and witness that once lit up the world in the book of Acts. It is the revolutionary light. It is the mantle of Elijah. For the time of compromise is over. The time of wavering back and forth is over. So many of you have wanted to live, oh Lord, I wish I could live in biblical times. Congratulations, you've got it. And so as God said in the Bible, he says now, choose you this day whom you will serve. The voice of Elijah is crying out, if Baal is God, serve him and go to hell. But if the Lord is God, serve him and go all the way in glory. The Lord is God. It is time to live with a mantle of Elijah, to speak with boldness, to live with confidence, to not be conformed to the times in which we live, but to be transformed and to transform the times. If these are the, we sing, these are the days of Elijah, these are the days, if these are the days of Elijah, it is time now that we become the Elijahs of the day. It is time to be bold, it's time to be whole, it's time to be 100%, time to be unhindered, uncompromised, unbound, all out, on fire, and mighty in the power of the Most High. 
If the dark is going from, from bad to worse, it's time for that the good you go from good to great. For the eyes of the Lord are searching the entire earth looking for the one whose heart is completely his. You be that one. He will show himself mighty on your behalf. He will lift you up to live a life of greatness for God has chosen you. God has called you for such a time as this. He has given you a great calling. God will appoint you. God will anoint you. God will empower you. God will lift you up. For thus says the Lord, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things you know not of. For I do know the plans I have for you to bless you, to give you a future and a hope. For the Lord says, kumi ori ki va orech arise and shine for your light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you for kings and queens and empires and kingdoms rise and fall but the name of the Lord shall endure forever and he's the only way the only truth and the only hope he's the king above all kings he sits on the throne of all thrones and his kingdom shall have no end in the name above all names the name of Yeshua HaMashiach Jesus the Messiah the light of the world the glory of Israel and the lion of the tribe of Judah forever and ever and ever and ever amen praise the Lord we praise you we bless you praise you father we thank you for your glory you're awesome you're forever you're the only king we love you and praise you use us speak to us power us we praise you